each other and use the Wong Chok Han site for housing. By the way, you could build three or four Taiku Sings there. In fact, you could build three there and still have an ocean park. Uh, why Why were you tying up all that land? I don't know. It's got, it's got an MTR already there. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think you need to. Can you bring it to this cafe? 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 Hi,唔係。得唔得？我有冇有冇膠紙啊？我唔得俾塊膠紙我貼住呢度。唔該。得唔得？我攞。唔該。細細條得㗎啦，想我黐住佢喺度。嚇？冇帶啊？是但啦
right from the time I arrived in Hong Kong. Which was what year? 1972. Yeah. So I've been here 48 years now. It seemed to me that there were always two things that Hong Kong had to bear in mind. Number one was be useful to China economically and economic development. And number two, never, never, never be a base for subversion against the central people's government. There's only two rules, um, and as long as we followed them, everything was going to be fine. Uh, that was that was my assessment from quite early on, and it hasn't really changed since then. I think we've been tremendously useful to China in terms of economic development. Um, and we've always been a base <laughs> well, for foreigners. The, uh, the, the world uses has used Hong Kong as a base to spy on China. For and many, many, many decades. Indeed, and China, in fairness, has also used Hong Kong as a springboard out to spy on the rest of the world. Well, so, when the Communist Party was formed a hundred years ago, they used this as a base too. Yes. So this is, has been Hong Kong's history. It has. That's what former president of LegCo, Jasper, said on my show. Right. So, so, so what's new? Uh, in that sense, uh, nothing. And I think we reached our mark with the establishment of the patriotic uh, organization for the, <laughs> the patriotic democracy. alliance yeah. led by Sito Wa. Yeah, and I think while Sito was around, uh, nobody challenged his patriotism, and I think he he was a wise leader of of the movement and of uh, that kind of democrat generally. And unfortunately, then I think things deteriorated. People people have been. Uh, You've got Pompeo when he was Secretary of State actually calling directly for the overthrow of the Communist Party in Beijing. He wanted regime change. So, well, that's the Americans. We're talking right. about Hong Kong. Yes. And to the extent that Hong Kong people reached out to Washington and went to see Pompeo and other senior officials, they put themselves in that quadrant. But let's bring us back to today, June right. 3rd. Do you think? Hong Kong people should have the liberty to go to Victoria Park tomorrow to commemorate what happened in 1989, something that I, they've done for more than 30 years. Yes, I think it's a pity. I, the rationale for this, as you know better than I, are these uh, health concerns over <laughs> large numbers of people. We're not wearing masks. Today. We're not wearing masks, but <laughs> we are a requisite distance apart, and we're not shouting, we're, we're talking. So 30, 40, 50, 100,000 people or more close together shouting at each other without masks, most of them I suspect, would be uh, arguably, I'm not making the argument, but it's an arguable proposition that that would be a health risk. I don't know what the Patriotic Alliance has told the, the police about, right. you know, but anyway, they did not get the permission. Right. And so, now I heard on the news that they are planning to deploy over 3,000 officers. Same, I saw the same thing. Not just in the Causeway Bay, Bay, but I, all over Hong Kong. I remember distinctly where I was on the 3rd, 4th of June, 1989. Where were you? I was actually in bed when I got a phone call yeah. from British media yeah. telling me that the tanks have gone in and we need a comment from the Hong Kong government. So why did they call you? What post were you they in? I was in information. <laughs> in a junior like position, they tried government house, couldn't get anybody, tried the chief secretary, couldn't get anybody, tried several other senior people, couldn't get anybody. Who was the governor then? And working down, who was, was that it would have been Wilson. Yeah. So they worked their way down the list and eventually... <laughs> hey, Mike Brown, <laughs> give us a comment. What did you say? I said, they said, how is the situation in Hong Kong? And I said, oh, I go, one, ah, one word answer. <laughs> fraught, I said, fraught. Because I, I think we all felt that something was going to happen and it wasn't going to be nice. Yeah. And so when it did happen, when the word came back that it had happened, and I, I think unquestionably it was a tragedy for, for Chinese people everywhere. And I, I do re remark upon it every year. I do remember every year. Um, I wonder if we need to grieve 
publicly in large numbers. Why, why do you well, want? Well, if you don't do it, that's fine. That's right. But many people want to do it. Fine, then they Why shouldn't they be allowed to do it? I think once the health thing has been removed, they'll have to be allowed again. No, well, they will bring out the NSL, the National Security They, they might. And the argument then would be, I guess, and again, I don't want to make the argument, I think the argument then would be by aligning yourself with those overseas who are attacking China, and want regime change in China, they are, you are putting yourself in their quadrant. Well, they, they, uh, they already criticize one of the slogans of yep. the Patriotic Alliance, that is to end one party rule. And your friend, good or bad, Carrie Lam, oh. has been asked several times at a press conference in the last few weeks, what about that slogan? And she kept evading. Of course, of course she did. And I loved, I liked Elsie Learn's answer to that question as what well. What did Elsie say? She I'm... said it's not a one-party state. There are eight or nine parties, <laughs> but the Communist Party is the ruling party. <laughs> so, well, so it's not one-party dictatorship, but, but but of course it is. It's written into the constitution. Yeah, that yeah. The Communist Party is the ruling party. Yeah. So, so, but we are one country, two systems. We are. If you, as I said, I go back to my two golden rules useful to China economically and not a base for subversion. Yeah. subversion. If you can make the argument, if some people make the argument, which they are now doing, that this, some of these activities represent subversion of the central government, then it will contravene the national security law. Mm. So I think that's regrettable. I, I very much uh, feel every year I, re I mark the anniversary myself. How did you do it? I do it at home. You never been to Victoria Park? No, I've been to Victoria Park, but not on this occasion. I've done. <laughs> I did one first of July march. Yeah. And I did the first of the marches on the extradition bill. Yeah. On the 9th of June, mm. 2019. Yeah. Because I, frankly, I was fed up with the government. And were I allowed to say lying to me? Uh, <laughs> you are responsible telling, for your words and telling, actions, yes. and they are all watching you, whether it's a Hong Kong government, mainland government, <laughs> any telling government. Telling less than the truth. Yeah. About Economical the, with the truth. <laughs> ex, ex, economically with the truth to the extent that they were presenting a false picture. I see. That's terrible. Yes. So, uh, so I marched. When did you leave? When did you retire from government? 2008. And, uh, At the age of 60, I had to retire. You had to uh, And you actually gave up your British citizenship. 20 years ago. Why? And that's a very, I, I'm often asked that question. You have all, to give me a short answer because we're I will. Much I understand. Time. You gave me that lecture before we started. <laughs> short answer was I was going around the world as a, uh, head of Invest Hong Kong, telling people that. To Hong invest Kong in Hong Kong. And you were a Brit. <laughs> to the best place to do business. And I was doing it with a British passport in my pocket. And that didn't feel natural to me. Mm. Because if I sold Ford motor cars and you looked in my garage and saw a Toyota or a Honda, you wouldn't believe me that Ford motor cars were better. So I wanted to be doing that with a Hong Kong SAR passport. So you're a Chinese national? I have been for 20 years this year, yes. Do you speak good Chinese? I have some Cantonese. I have zero Punawa. <laughs> Why can't you improve on your Chinese language ability? That's a very good question. I, I, my alibi is that my first wife, Chinese wife, was an English teacher. And she <laughs> wanted to bring up the children in English. So she said. So she did. So we never spoke Cantonese at home. Uh, Later, one of those sons, one of our sons, uh, after graduating from the UK, went to Beijing for two years, learned Putonghua, learned to read and write. And he now lives in Beijing. He can't communicate with you in Chinese. <laughs> this, this second wife, my second Chinese wife, uh, has a completely different philosophy. Told you not to learn Chinese. No, that our two children, uh, a girl and a boy, speak Cantonese. That's their natural language together. And they also speak excellent English and Punghua. What about the father? The father, therefore, from that point onwards, had to improve his Cantonese. But uh, with great difficulty. With yeah. great difficulty, and I could trade a few sentences with you now. But as soon as we start to discuss something, I'm not. I'm not going to. I'm not going to start it. But uh, I think that's a good you, idea. You wear your hat, uh, going around the world asking people to invest in Hong Kong. Yes. 
Do you think you can still do that now with the current situation? I can, but it, the current situation is not as helpful <laughs> as it might be. How, what, what kind of concerns do you think our potential foreign investors may have? I think they would be dismayed by the, frankly, the lack of competence in the administration. <laughs> Um, not not with the uh, NSL or things in, like uh, that, or banning so the June 4th candlelight like vigil. These, these companies do business in the mainland. Why would they be afraid of the NSL in Hong Kong? So it, they, they, do, they do business in all sorts of places where the law, law as regards its citizens are not, is not that amenable. So no, I don't think that is a huge handicap by itself. Um, if I'm, this is still a very good base to do business with China. It's a very good base for mainland companies to access world markets. So I would sell Hong Kong on that basis if I was still in Invest Hong Kong. Now, what about the incompetence of the Kerry Lam well, administration? We only have to, not that say, much time. You, you just highlight the key points. If you, have, if you have three or four years, we could get, we could get <laughs> maybe down next this. time. If you are a good maybe. boy, maybe I will invite you back next time. But tell us, I don't, what is the biggest problem with Kerry Lam? The biggest problem, right since 1997, has been that as a government, as a community, we've never learned properly how to ra handle the relationship with Beijing. Mm. She, but that's, she, that's she, governance. Yes, but she's now subservient to it. There's no, yeah. no question she doesn't represent Hong Kong with Beijing. She represents Beijing to Hong Kong people, um, which is part of the problem that Beijing's having and that we have with her. But you said that began with CH Tong, huh? That we are CH had a limited role, which was to show that one country, two systems could work. And I think for the first five years, he did okay. He did that. Uh, but then for the, the challenge for his second term was to show that he could address the social and other issues. In Hong Kong. He obviously couldn't. It just wasn't his cup of tea. So he had to go and they brought Donald in. Um, and, and after that, Donald made some mistakes, did some things good, but after that, it just sort of drifted. And, um, so what about Kerry? Well, she's not up to the job. She's not a politician. She's an administrator. She's Who's a politician? Was CH a politician? Was Donald a politician? Was CY a politician? Donald was a bit of one. <laughs> a bit of one. CY was, or is, because of course he's <laughs> saying he might run again. People are saying on <laughs> his behalf. He's watching you now. People are saying on his behalf he might run. I don't know why he would do that. <laughs> is the position he has in the mainland is actually more senior. I think he's very bored with being the vice chair of the CPBCC. Perhaps, perhaps he is. I actually think we need a fresh place. You don't think Kerry should run again? I don't think either of those two should run again. Yeah. I think we need a fresh face. Such as? Well, that's where you run into difficulties. <laughs> I'm not at all sure. I've had heard the argument that perhaps we should forget about this. We should go back to the pre-1997 situation. Which is, where, get Beijing to appoint yes, someone. Yes, They sent us a governor, the British oh. sent us a governor. We had no argument who's the governor, because we had no say in it. They sent a cargo from, uh, from yeah. China. Send someone who knows how to handle the central government, and then can sit on top of the Hong Kong and say, look, I know exactly, I don't have to consult anybody. I know exactly what we can do and what we can't do, vis-a-vis uh, -vis relations with Beijing. I think Beijing still wants some people to pretend to believe that we still have one country, I, two systems. I think this is Actually, do we still have one country, two systems yeah, as far as you're yeah, concerned? We, yes, we do. Because I can, I can WhatsApp here and I can't WhatsApp in the mainland. Uh, I've got grandchildren in the mainland. I know. You can't WhatsApp them. Uh. I can't WhatsApp them. I have to WeChat them and my WeChat's not working. So <laughs> I can Google in Hong Kong and I can't Google in the mainland. I can, I can get, interestingly, the last time I went, I could get the BBC website on my computer, but I couldn't get the RTHK one because the RTHK one is bilingual. Mm. So it's more scary uh, for the mainland authorities. Um, but talking about RTHK... So, but your question was, have we got one country, two systems? Yes. To because an extent, we still have a little bit of RTHK. Yeah. And, and we can still talk freely as we are now. <laughs> you know, I look outside the door, I don't see any 
police officers coming in to arrest us both. Look, Maybe they're waiting downstairs. They're, they're monitoring us. I, I don't mind. I'm happy you that. like to be monitored day and night. No, I don't know. I don't like to be monitored day and night. But, but I don't think I am. And uh, I'm free to raise a family. I'm free to go on and read whatever media I like and so on in ways that I would not be free. Would, I'm not free if I go to the mainland. When I go to the mainland, using my home, home return visit. permit thing. As I'm sure that quite a lot of people have declined to be vaccinated, leave aside normal hesitance. What, uh, why aren't we doing much, much more in terms of incentives and in terms of sticks, carrots and sticks? Um, you want a passport? Okay, show us your vaccine certificate. You want a home return permit? Show us your vaccine certificate. You want to employ a helper? Show us your vaccine certificate. You are a helper, show us your vaccine certificate. So for a very good reason, it's not, it's not competent. <laughs> and you, you know, we used to, you, you got to pluck so many things. And that's why there's never short of material for my column. We used to lead the world in electric car purchase. Why was that? Because we had incentives for electric vehicles, right? We were doing fantastically well at reducing roadside pollution. In come the importers of foul diesel cars from Europe complaining like hell, why are you discriminating against us? Because you pollute the atmosphere and you're killing our citizens. Well, no, we don't say that. We say, oh, sorry. Okay, well, we'll change the system then so that electric cars are much more expensive than the diesel cars that you've been uh, producing and lying about the environmental implications of, really? by the way. Yes, of course. So you know, all the thing, uh, the uh, Sun Jun and all that, they are ahead of us. She said, oh, I don't mind. She said, she doesn't mind. <laughs> yeah. well, I don't know what's the matter with her. Well, I think, I think myself, I'm trying to be kind here. I think she had a kind of a breakdown in 2019. Yeah. Um, and After the protests, yeah. Uh, and I, I, she I, disappeared for weeks. Yes, I think she may have recovered. She's restored herself to a, to a degree, but I just don't think it's in her interest or in our interest to, to carry for on. To, for her to carry on, I she think. gave an interview to the SEMP a few weeks ago, saying, "I'm back." Everybody said, "Oh my God!" <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think it's in her own interest that she not continue. It's certainly in Hong Kong's interest. Yeah. Well, actually, it's not just her, but what are the senior officials? So many people have commented to me to say that you never see them in the streets or anywhere. No. Because they dare not. I don't know that if they dare not. It's, a, a, no one would know who the hell they are, most of them. And they're just not very good. Um, I, I once listed out the number of targets for transport and housing that had been met, and the answer is naught. And I listed out all the ones that had not been met. And it's just incredible. There he is, carrying on as the Secretary for Transport and Housing. You know, and you could you could draw up similar lists right through the cabinet. I know. In the mainland, if something happened, the pandemic or whatever, the guys immediately sacked. Do you know who I saw on the TV the other night who reminded me of all this was E.K. Yo. Yeah, he he, he resigned. Did resign. I think he was pushed. He may was maybe he pushed. Was pushed. Uh, maybe he was resigned. Maybe he wanted to go. Maybe he was nudged a bit. But the fact is, he resigned. He resigned. And Regina Yip also resigned. Right. And since and, then, uh, and what's his name? Uh, Anthony Leung resigned. Well, he was caught red-handed, wasn't he? <laughs> with, yeah. his, uh, with his hand in the till. I mean, you, yeah. <laughs> when you're when you're the, when the 7-Eleven camera has got you stealing stuff from the shelf, you, you can't hang around very long. Mm. So, uh, but now nobody, nobody. Nobody's, nobody's, nobody's accountable for anything. Yeah, very so bad. One, uh, one of the things I think also is the weakness in LegCo. And I've got to say that I think the pandems, I'm not the Democratic Party, but the pandems generally have played their hand badly. Um, uh, you can't have a House committee spending nine months electing a chairman. This is mm -hmm. absurd. I think it's less than nine months, but and anyway. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you've got, so you've got routine stuff like extending maternity leave from 10 weeks to 14 weeks can't be approved because there's no chairman of the House committee to draw up the agenda and all this. This is nonsense. Uh, if the filibustering went on for months to stop the national anthem law. What, what's wrong with the national anthem law? What? 
you know, pick your battles. What do you think about the so-called improvements to the electoral well, they're, system? They're not improvements at all. What, what it, do you think? How would you describe them? It's ground zero. We, we've, everything's been destroyed, yeah. and we've gone back to naught. Um, now, whether we can, whether that was a necessary step in order that we start building again, which seems to be the, the government line, although it's hard to tell. Um, uh, maybe let, let, let them put, make that case, but we've gone right back to to where we were um, ten years before the handover, in fact, yeah. with the LegCo basically being handpicked, um, with all the, all the all the ministers will be on it, you know, all the rest of it. <laughs> so it's where we had no democracy at all under the British. We still don't have any democracy. And now we're going to have much much less than we had. Yeah. After you guys did the deal in 2010, yeah, that was, but that, to my mind, was a tipping point. You sat down, you hammered out a deal. Was it perfect? No, it wasn't. Was it progress? Yes, it was. And you got immediately kicked to death by all the other pan-democratic Not parties. Not all, but some. Yes, yeah. they went all over you. They and called was, you traitors and everything bad. else. It was it's very, very bad. bad. But that's what politics is. I know. It's it's half a loaf stuff. Yeah. And we had half a loaf, and instead of saying, right, now there's a bigger loaf, we want half of that one as well, nope, nothing. You you don't stick your head above the parapet again, because you're going to be shot at again by no, no, no. the other parties. No. Yes, I did. kept saying that if you turn the clock back, I would have done exactly the same you thing. You do, you, but you're no. on your own, Emily. Hmm? No, you're, no. You're, yes, but you are. I think, I think the party made a big mistake when people started attacking us. And then they say, oh, well, those people are pan-democrats, so let us not row. No. But of course, it turned out that those who attacked us so viciously are not pan-democrats. Probably, maybe, sent by some powerful people to uh, attack us. Because otherwise, the, my party could be very popular and we could win many seats in the upcoming election. And many parties would not like it. So it's well, politics is very you're being, dirty. You're being very kind to some of the other members of the Pan Democratic Coalition. I mean, one party, on its own headed note paper, signed a letter to the senior member of the U.S. Senate and the senior member of the U.S. House, saying, "Please take action, action against our country." I mean, what kind of mindset was that? Well, there are all kinds of people in the world. Yes, there are idiots and big idiots. And the people who signed that letter were big idiots. Now, of course, you know, I'm supposed to be generous of spirit because I think most, most <laughs> of them are in jail now or they run away. But what kind of political thinking was behind that letter? Now, Mike, Yes. whether we have improvement or we have a degradation of our electoral We're system. Back, back to zero, yes. But the elections are coming up. Yes, they are. Are you going to stand? I, I heard some talk, discussion, that you may want to stand. Maybe not yet as chief executive, but as a electrical member. You're, you're being very witty here because you heard this talk from me over lunch. <laughs> so if you the want to tell that, the netizens... I am exploring the option of running for LegCo. I have consulted various people, I've looked at it, to see whether I think it's a good idea. Now I have met Mr. Lokin Hay, who, by the way, I found very impressive. My, the chair of my party. Yes, the chair yeah. of your party. I, who I else have you met? Uh, I'm not sure I should name all of them, <laughs> but I did I did want to find out whether it would be an absolute no uh, from Beijing. Did you meet mainland officials? Uh, it depends on what category you put CY Learn. Yeah, oh, <laughs> of course he is. He's a yes. leader. But I, I said right from the beginning, look, if this is going to be a red light, I'm not going to waste everybody's time. If it's not an absolute red light, then I will continue to explore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's where we are. No red light yet. Huh? No red light yet. What well, about from your wife? Yes, <laughs> that's the one I fear the most, actually. Is it is it amber or red? It's no color at all. She ah. refuses to switch the system on. Oh, I see. So you better not. You know, if, if, if there's disagreement in the family... My, okay. No, well, it's not... Both the children think it's okay, <laughs> but they want me to clear disagreement, it... Disagreement, I say. Clear it with mum first. Yeah, sure. Which is natural. Yeah. So the answer is, 
I'm exploring it, whether it's a waste why, of time. Why do you want to do it, Mike? I think someone <laughs> has to speak up for the moderate middle. <laughs> and I just don't. I just you don't, don't think the, uh, the the now what the group in Letco, which this mainland professor called the loyal trash, you don't think they're speaking up for the middle? No, absolutely not. I think, what are they? Who are they speaking I for? I think I would put myself. Uh, I think they're speaking for themselves and for people who think they can benefit from this one-sided situation. Mm. Um, so I don't think there are people. The people who I like. <laughs> and, and whose opinions I'm most in tune with are either emigrated, huh? or, or, emigrated or, or in or jail. jail. <laughs> and, so you are going to follow them? <laughs> well, I don't want. I, don't, I certainly don't want a volunteer to go to jail. I, <laughs> but I, I just think we need a voice for the moderate middle. <laughs> and if if someone else is ready to be that voice, and I think would do the job better than me, then again, that's part of the exploration process. Um, <laughs> but at the moment, I think most of the pandems have, are leaning towards not running at all. Mm. Um, I think uh, certainly from the reaction of people who donate, uh, the, De the Democratic Party is probably the most mild party on that in that big camp. And the people who donate the money, who support, have been saying in the street, apparently, to the party representatives, don't run, don't run, it's a waste of time. Um, I understand that sentiment. Uh, and if the party therefore decides in September they're not going to put up any candidates, I, I would respect that. Um, and I certainly wouldn't run against a Democrat if the Democrats put up a candidate. And I've told Mr. Lowe that. Um, uh, so, there, so there we are. But I just think there's got to be a moderate voice speaking for the middle ground. And uh, if the Democrats don't provide it, and people like myself should think about doing so. Well, I think uh, it will help if you improve your Chinese a little bit in Europe. Yes, right. it would. I know. I'm going to have to go into a tense, intensive course. Of, uh, <laughs> yeah. and, but, but, but the reason I started to improve when I did was because I found my children talking in Cantonese. And, and you couldn't understand. Right. And then, I, and then one morning, I, I started to get better. And one morning in the car on the way to school, you could I, talk to them. Huh? I, yeah, and I heard them speaking Chinese, but not Cantonese. Come for the hot lah, hot lah, huh? Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Any questions? Yes. Yes, Keith. With the NSL and the improvement of the electoral system, do you think it is harder for the government to improve its legitimacy? Yes, I think it's now impossible. Um, it's not the NSL so much. Um, that, that was another wasted opportunity by everybody. We should have done this ourselves years ago, and I've written columns to this effect several times. The same with uh, extradition. There's nothing wrong in principle with extradition. Every government should have a proper system of extradition. But we failed. We failed with national security. We failed with extradition. And then things just got landed on us imposed upon us. They imposed upon us because of our failure. So now this political system, um, I think one of its weaknesses is that it makes it impossible for the government, local government, to gain the trust of most of the Hong Kong people. So uh, has it made it harder? I think it's made it almost impossible. So is it risky for Hong Kong's future? If it is very hard to improve the No, I, I don't think so from a, from a business perspective and for most, most aspects of daily life. No, it, I'm afraid governments sometimes have an overinflated view of their own role in society. Society is uh, people, it's families, it's churches, it's employers, it's all sorts of people who have an effect. I think the business environment will be fine. Um, I think the family situation will be fine. Um, also the law and order situation will be fine. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter how much you sympathize with someone who's demonstrating against what you agree is a bad law, there's no excuse for smashing up MTR stations which ordinary people used to get to work or go to school. 
I, walk, I was going to the studio one morning for my show. I, I had to walk most of the way. All right. I don't expect sympathy for walking. Right? I, walking is good and healthy. But on the way past, I see students from a nearby university smashing all the traffic lights. Now, how did that advance the cause of democracy? Tell me. It didn't. It was just stupid vandalism. Okay. And for the business part, you said that it is. I mean, the improvement in the electoral system and as a NSF. You know, I didn't. I never called improvement of, of the electoral system. The it's been changed. Of yes. The electoral system. Yes. So why do you think it does not affect Hong Kong's business atmosphere? Because. <laughs> Business tries its best to ignore governments everywhere. Um, in the sense, what they're concerned about is efficiency. That if you have an application to the government to do something, they want it processed in accordance with the rules. So they want clear rules and they want speedy processing. They're not they're not concerned with these uh, principles that you and I can talk about over coffee afterwards or something. Uh, no, they just want clear business decisions. But the NSF is ambiguous. <laughs> no, I don't think it is in practice. And again, you're talking about companies that do business in the mainland. Why would they be terrified in Hong Kong and feel confident in the mainland? That's just silly. You no, know, they have doubts. Where they have doubts, they have those doubts all over the world. According to the, so I don't think Hong Kong is worse than the mainland. It's arguably better than the mainland. And mainland companies like doing business here. We, we, that was one of the big innovations that we introduced uh, 10 odd years ago when I was in Invest Hong Kong. We did campaigns in the mainland to attract mainland companies to set up in Hong Kong. Uh, last question. Yes. This is more political. Yes. Last year, the government decided to end Hong Kong business option for expanding its space yes. to and announced to get back the land. And uh, as the former uh, tourism commission, how do you think the government can make use of the new land? Well, that land at the moment is a quarantine center, isn't it? See, uh, people, <coughs> if I may say so, I, I'm at least one of the three members of LegCo who voted against Hong Kong Disneyland. Okay, I, let me just table that out because I remember the other two were Christine Lowe and Margaret. Mm -hmm. So congratulations to the three of you. Uh, <laughs> and congratulations to me because I got more members to vote for it. But um, the deal with Hong Kong Disneyland, it was a strategic decision. And it runs for 100 years, not 50 years, not to 2047. It runs for 100 years. And it covers three potential theme parks. Now, as it turned out, the, the theme park development in Hong Kong has not been as successful, wildly successful, as we hoped it would be. Um, we have two world-class theme parks here, Hong Kong Disneyland and Ocean Park. Um, but it's unlikely that you can rule out the third one. Um, that's not going to happen. The second one was, was a nice option to have if we could have worked together better with Disney to make the first one successful, more successful. There were problems on both sides. Disney began with quite a few mistakes, actually. They made mistakes on, on marketing, but they put them right quickly. They made mistakes on uh, operations, but they put them right quickly. That's what happens when you're the world's number one theme park operator. Remember, when we were talking to Disney, we had a list of the world's top theme parks. Of the top ten, nine were run by Disney. I mean, <laughs> it was no question. The only other runner in that race was was Universal. Um, but we did a deal with number one. And we talked to Universal during the negotiations, just as Disney talked to Shanghai. But uh, it was it was a deal with a uh, based on a vision, and I still think it's a great asset for Hong Kong, the part that we've got. Um, I try and go every month. I always buy an annual pass every year and I keep the receipts so that there's not going to be any nasty allegations of improper behavior. 
um, my bypass, I try and get there as often as I can. I had my 70th birthday there uh, a couple of years ago in the Enchanted Garden uh, with Mickey and Minnie and the other characters came, came through, uh, friends from England, relatives from around the world. And it was a great party. And I love to go there. I feel great every time I go there. And uh, it's been hit, of course, by the pandemic. Now, you can't close a theme park for months at a time and then wonder why the results are bad. <laughs> results are bad because you won't let anyone in the door. Okay, thank you, Mike. In the future, should the land be used for maybe building housing assets? Well, you mean the next door land? I mean, the, the land that was served or served for the basin or No, no, I don't think it should. I think we should be developing uh, an entertainment and luxury, luxury entertainment hub, hub. I hate to use the word hub. It's an obvious place to relocate Ocean Park, for example, and have the two world-class theme parks next to each other and use the Wong Chok Han site for housing. By the way, you could build three or four Taiku Sings there. In fact, you could build three there and still have an ocean park. Uh, why Why were you tying up all that land? I don't know. It's got, it's got an MTR already there. Okay, thank you, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.